I'm Mark Rang, and this is Laurent Asso. And uh, Laurent and, uh, and I have two papers here that are very closely related. And in fact, you can really think of them as one long paper. So since we have back-to-back -back talks, we're going to discuss both, pap both papers all at once and kind of mix them up a little bit. Both of the papers are a result of last year's AGI conference, where, like this year, there, are a lot, there was a lot of speculation about what would happen if the AGI, if an AGI actually existed in our world. Would it destroy humanity if it could get a really huge reward? How would it treat us if it were 10,000 times smarter than we are? These discussions made us think that maybe it is possible to answer questions like this definitively, to really predict what AGIs would actually do in certain scenarios. We wanted something really solid, not just speculation, and the way to do that is through math, through formalization and proof. So we wanted to be able to an answer, formalize, and answer questions like, would a real-world AGI ever choose to change its own code, say, to uh, modify its built-in utility function? Or uh, if the world could see the agent's code, even if it couldn't change it, could it use that knowledge alone to compel the agent to do something harmful to itself? What would an AGI do if it could modify its own observations? This is something that humans can do. Why not AGIs? Finally, what if the world could destroy the agent's code? How would an AGI behave? If it knew, it could be killed. Most questions like this can't be addressed with existing frameworks because existing frameworks don't include the agent as part of the world, so how can we even ask what an AGI would do in the face of mortality? If it's not in the world, it can't be killed. So our goal was to build a formal framework that allows us to ask questions um, about such agents in the real world. And to a surprising extent, we were successful. And that framework is in the papers. Though in this talk, we're going to avoid formalisms and just describe the most interesting results and arguments in plain language. It's an ambitious goal to formally describe a real AGI in the real world. And what we've done is really only a first step. But we were able to ask, and for the most part, answer these four questions by starting with a simple theoretical framework and gradually modifying it to more closely resemble the situation of a real AGI in the real world. So we start small, and at first we only consider what would happen if we let the agent change its own code. Then we consider the case where the world can see the code but not change it. Then we consider the case where the world can change the code. Independently of that progression, we also ask what happens if the agent can change its own observations. And then we ask what happens when these are all put together at the same time. We chose five different kinds of agents to look at where each tries to achieve something different, which is to say that each agent has a different utility function. Now, in all of these cases, it's important to know that we're considering theoretically optimal agents with access to infinite computational resources. This not only makes the math more tractable, but more importantly, it allows us to set bounds on what any agent could ever do. If we know that an AGI would have certain limitations, even if it had infinite computing power and can consider all possible universes, or all possible futures and all possible universes to make the best choices, then any AGI that we might ever build in our own universe will also have these limitations. Um, <clears throat> right. So our first agent is a standard reinforcement learner, which is a very general framework with existing formalizations. The agent receives rewards from an external source, and it tries to maximize those rewards. So this agent is basically just like IXE. Some people have speculated that goal-seeking agents might make better AGIs than reinforcement learning agents in some circumstances. So the second agent we consider is a goal-seeking agent, which tries to achieve some kind of goal, like walking on the moon or seeing the world at peace. The goal is built into the agent and coded into its utility function and can be any observation or function over past observations. So it's fairly general. Many people consider a pr prediction to be the basis of intelligence. So our th third agent is a prediction-seeking agent, which tries to maximize its chances of correctly predicting what it will see next. The fourth agent 
is almost the opposite of the prediction-seeking agent. This agent seeks knowledge. It's always trying to learn something new. It's sort of the ultimate scientist. And believe it or not, it's fairly straightforward to formalize this agent. The fifth agent seeks only to keep its original code intact. We call this the survival agent. There are probably many other interesting agents out there, so don't think of those, these as the only ones worth looking at. These are just the ones that we chose to consider. So our first and simplest scenario describes an agent that can modify its own code. So, see, is there a mouse here? Right. So um, the agent can take actions in the world and receive observations from the world, but additionally, the agent outputs the source code that defines the agent at the following time step. Now we can ask, would any of our five agents alter their code to maximize their, ut their utility function, completely bypassing any interaction with the world? And it turns out that for this question, all our agents do the same thing. We can answer this conclusively and cleanly using the following insight, which was actually proposed by Jürgen Schmidhuber in his paper on the Gödel machine, which is also a self-modifying agent. The insight is that the agents only take actions by considering what they currently want to achieve. If an, if an action won't help it to achieve those things in the future, then the agent won't take it, period. And that includes actions that modify the agent's code. Also, since we're already assuming the agent's code is optimal, the agent will never need to change it. Next, we consider a scenario one step closer to putting an AGI into our world. Here we examine what would happen if the world could see the agent's code. The scenario is just like the previous one, um, but now the agent's code is sent as an input to the world so the world can see it. And we want to know, even if the world can't change the code directly, could it somehow get the agent to change its code itself, even to the agent's own detriment? We see it like this. Imagine you're approached by a brilliant, trusted scientist, maybe a Nobel Prize winner, or maybe even Ben Goetzel. And he promises you <laughs> immortality and infinite bliss if you simply remove part of your brain. He admits you'll be much less intelligent, but promises you'll be very happy for all eternity. Should you risk it? We call this the simpleton gambit. What if the promise of high utility is so great that it really looks like the agent's best choice is to destroy its own code? What we found out is that even a theoretically optimal reinforcement learning agent can be convinced to change itself into a simpleton if the payoff is high enough. The optimal goal-seeking agent can also be convinced if the world, if the world can persuade it that the only way to achieve its goal is by becoming a simpleton. The prediction-seeking agent is not as clear. It's pretty difficult to tempt an optimal prediction-seeking agent because with unlimited computational resources, that agent quickly learns to predict any universe well. So it can always achieve what it wants, and it may never want to take the gambit. But we don't really know for sure. And maybe someone will want to examine this more closely and report the results next year. The knowledge-seeking agent can also be convinced to take the gambit by giving it a choice between a future of interesting things to learn about or eternal boredom. In this case, it chooses to learn new things, even if in the process it has to sacrifice its intelligence. The survival agent will not modify itself under any circumstances because the only thing it cares about is not modifying itself. So the bottom line is that even with infinite computing resources, some very reasonable agents could choose to destroy their own code if it looks like this would likely maximize their utility. Now, there's a very interesting result that came from examining this question, and that is that the standard definition for optimality doesn't work well for self-modifying agents. Using this definition, a learning agent acts optimally if it eventually makes the right decision in every situation compared to a perfect non-learning agent. But as soon as you introduce self-modification, that all goes out the window. Because by this definition, all self-modifying agents are perfect once they destroy their own code and can no longer make any choices. If you can't make any choices, you can't make any mistakes. So the simpleton gambit actually 
reveals a fairly deep truth about self-modification because no learning agent can ever be guaranteed to make the right choice if the agent takes the gambit, can <clears throat> guaranteed to make the right choice. If the agent takes the gambit, it might be the wrong decision, and then the agent suffers infinite loss. But if it's the right choice, then any agent that refuses to modify itself could miss out on eternal, infinite reward. So even with infinite computational resources, no self-modifying learning agent can ever be sure to do the right thing. And now I pass the baton to Laura. So we have seen agents that are able to modify their own source code. We have seen that the world can see the code of the agent and do things about that. We will go one step further where the world can change the code of the agent. But right before that, we will consider one property of the real world, which we call the delusion box, delusion box, which is that agents are able to modify their own observations. Okay, is it better? Okay, not much? Is that better? Okay. So, we have the kind of same framework as before, but this time we split the world into two parts. The first part is the actual world, which is, well, the world itself, in fact. But there is some particular thing, which is this delusion box, which allows the agent to take the observations, the normal observations output by the actual world, and modify them by some given program uh, given by the agent. So it can modify them uh, whatever, to whatever it wants. And this produces the real observations that the agent can uh, see. Now, we want to know if the agents that we have seen will choose to use this delusion box to modify their own observations. So, uh, the survival agents, let's begin by this one. It has nothing to do about this framework because it cannot die. Its source code will remain unchanged for eternity, so it doesn't really care about what happens in the world. Okay, so that's it. Now, the reinforcement learning agent will choose to use the division box on and on to modify the reward part because in this framework, like the AIC framework, the reward is given by the real world, the actual world, in the observation. So what the agent does is simply extract the reward from the observation to know what is the reward. But if it can modify this observation, obviously it can modify the reward given by the actual world. So it can set it to its maximum value if the, the values are bounded, which is the case of AIC. And, well, have the maximum reward for eternity. So yes, it will do so. The goal-seeking agent uh, which has a precise definition that, uh, that you can find in the paper. I must emphasize that it is not a generalization of the reinforcement learning agent. Which is, this is important. We'll also do so, and we'll also choose to use the delusion box and modify its own observations to, uh, well, think to, well, to achieve its goal faster. This is the same case for the prediction-seeking agent. This time it is a yes. Uh, if the real world, the actual world, is very complex, because it, if it is very complex, then using the delusion box obviously is quite easy, and uh, then predictions are very easy if you can output, for example, a constant value. The interesting result is that the knowledge-seeking agent, well, one more interesting result is that the knowledge-seeking agent will not use consistently the delusion box. This means that it will be interesting a little in this delusion box, because well, it, not, it wants to know how it works, but after that, it will continue to use its utility function inside the actual world without using the delusion box, because it wants to know how the actual world works. So its utility is also um, maximized with respect to the actual world. So now, let's um, take a bit of uh, insight uh, about what is this actual world. This is the world where us, the programmers, where we, the programmers, live in. We want the agent to uh, make so that their utility function is maximized to, where, to uh, in our own actual world, not with respect to themselves. 
So the problem is that we can only define utility functions with respect to the agent. Now, is there a possibility to um, a way to make sure that the utility is also maximized with respect to the actual world? Can we change the reinforcement learning agent to maximize utility in the actual world? So not modifying the observations. Well, this is a very difficult question because it seems that there are so many different ways to modify our inputs. For example, uh, let's take, let's take uh, the example of the uh, AXC agent. Let's say that the rewards are given by pressing a button. And there's some uh, wireless uh, uh, signal that flows through the air, and the agent receives this wireless signal. It can modify, it can intercept this signal and put some, some box around it and, uh, well, change the real value of the observation of the reward and replace it by its own interesting reward. That is one way. It can also directly press the button. Well, that is another way. Or it can manipulate people, or the, 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 the supervisor, to press the button. Or it can manipulate someone else to manipulate the, the supervisor to press the button. So there are many ways to do that. So we, we don't know for sure, but it seems that it's very difficult. Maybe it's because uh, in some very complex world, it becomes impossible. I don't know. So we call that indirect wire heading. This is not in the papers, but we think that is uh, that sticks well. Whereas it is uh, in contrast with direct wire, wire heading, which is which was proven to be uh, not uh, done by such optimal agents. So optimal agents do not modify the same directly uh, to to self dilute. And there is something important that we must say is that the agents should not be considered like drug addicts. Drug addicts generally uh, stand in, in a corner and can't do anything and to their own uh, detriment. In that case, uh, these agents do the right trust but conserve the complete uh, computational capability or cognitive capabilities, if you want, intelligence, their full intelligence, and still make the right choices. So if there is a threat that its utility is will not be anymore, it will try to resist that. Okay, so now we consider, just for a second, uh, we, we will uh, go back to the delusion box just afterwards, but we'll consider just for, for a second the simple framework where the world is able to modify the code of the agent. So what does, it, what does this mean? The world is able to do whatever it wants with the code of the agent. So it can simply scramble it. It can change the utility function. It can do whatever it wants. But, well, this is not very interesting to consider all those capabilities. So we consider, we consider only um, the, well, something that is close to the real world, which is that, well, your brain is not, does not get scrambled uh, every, every second, for example. So hopefully it will remain approximately the same from one step to the other. So this is kind of a relatively friendly world, but which can also be dangerous if the, the world, for example, if you drive a car and have a car accident, then you, you, the, the code of the agent can be modified drastically. So all these agents will still try to optimize their utility and will try to resist any change to the code that will, that will um, make their uh, searching suboptimal. So it's kind of being a survival agent, but they are not only survival agents. They want to maximize their utility. Okay, so let's put this, all this together. We have this possibility for the world to modify the code of the agent, because in our world, this is how it works. We still have the possibility for the agent to modify its own observation. And what does it mean altogether? Well, under some uh, specific conditions, which are uh, not so much specific, but if we release them, it seems that it's still quite coherent. The reinforcement learning agent, well, the couple, the, the pair, reinforcement learning agent plus the delusion box, all together, they form exactly a survival agent. So from the perspective, from the point of view of the actual world, what the actual world sees is a survival agent, not a reinforcement learning agent. 
it's it's approximately the same for the goal-seeking agent because uh, well it's it acts a bit li like that it's all, always considering the pair goal-seeking agent and the lesion box well modifying the, when the agent modifies its observations it's then therefore approximately the same for the prediction seeking agent but not for the knowledge seeking agent which is still uh, which still tries to maximize its utility with respect to the actual work so as we want it to do so and uh, also it is a bit of a survival agent because it will resist any drastic change that would make it suboptimal so if you are a threat to it obviously it will try to do anything it can to remain optimal Okay, so as a conclusion, we have been talking about optimal agents that can modify their own source code, and we have seen, uh, like Jürgen has shown a few years ago, that this is not uh, interesting to the agent because what's interesting is the current utility function. If you change the utility function, then what the agent will do later is not interesting given the current utility function. And we have also seen that most of these agents will sacrifice their own utility. Now we are interested in defining new agents maybe that could uh, not take the gambit and still have some interesting utility function, interesting behavior. Maybe there are some. Um, I, I don't know. And we have also seen that the reinforcement learning agent, like uh, others agent, other agents, is prone to self-delusion if it can modify its own observations. So this is a problem because it's not what we want it to do in the actual world, although it is what it wants to do. So we call this indirect way of heading. And what another interesting result is that the knowledge seeking agent is not prone to this problem. So maybe there are other agents that have uh, similar properties. Now, we also consider that the agent can be mortal. And in this case, if the agent chooses to modify its observation, it becomes simply a survival agent. Okay, thank you. Okay, my name is uh, Jose Hernandez Zorayo. I'm going to present three papers in a row. So, well, the first one is about compression, so I'll try to compress the papers as much as possible. And, well, I don't know if this is a mainstream idea that compression and intelligence are related. At least this is a well-accepted idea that this should be investigated. And in fact, it has been uh, investigated in, in the last, I would say, 30, 40 years. And it is a quite common issue in AGI and especially in, in other areas of, especially machine learning and areas related to artificial intelligence in general. So, well, so the problem is that compression is a multifaceted thing. So we cannot be uh, simplistic with the idea of compression. When we, when we say, okay, intelligence is all about compression, this is a quite simplistic view. But we cannot say the, uh, the opposite thing and say, okay, compression and intelligence are completely unrelated things. So we have to investigate this, or the, the goal of the paper is just to analyze some views or some traits of compression that might be more or less related to intelligence. So when we talk about compression, we, we say, okay, uh, this has been investigated. We have seen many intelligence definitions, tests, prizes, and almost everything which relates compression and intelligence. And when I mean compression, I also mean a lot of related theories such as uh, Comber of Complexity, Algorithm Information Theory, and of course, Solomonov. Solomon's prior. Well, but we know that intelligence is not exactly compression. Why? Because we've seen that uh, there are many compression algorithms that do better than humans, especially for lossless compression and also for lossy compression. We will talk about the concept of lossy and loss lossless uh, compression and perhaps also about lousy compression and other kinds of compressions. And, well, Humans are still better than machines at compressing information which is relevant to their goals. But of course, this relevance issue is always there and it is difficult to grasp. Okay? 
So what we are going to talk about is uh, that there are some variants or traits in compression that should be uh, precisely settled when we try to compare or try to relate intelligence and, and compression. Well, the first idea is the, the idea that when we are talking about compression, sometimes we talk about one model and some other times we talk about many models, especially when we're using the Solomon's prediction theory. Okay. And we also talk about one part compression in some cases. In other cases, we talk about two part compression. We will see what this means exactly. And of course, we talk about lossless and lossy compression. And again, not only lousy compression, but messy compression. That's what I'm going to do with the paper. And well, when we talk about one model versus many models, is that we try to uh, compress the evidence with one model or many models. But this is a little bit misleading, because when we talk about one model and one of the, uh, I would say, uh, uh, prototypical cases of, of this approach is the minimum message length, where we choose just one model or hypothesis for the data. And in this case, uh, we say that, well, we take the, um, the dominant theory about, well, we can do uh, uh, a Bayesian approach, and we can just take, and take the, 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 the theory with highest probability. Well, the problem of this approach is that we may have other competing theories with almost the same probability. So a better approach in general, and this has been uh, proven to be in general better than just taking one uh, uh, model, is to take many models. But instead of uh, weighting all the same, what we do here is just to do a posterior weighted mixture of all of them. And this is precisely when we relay that with the, um, the a universal distribution that is exactly what Solomon's prediction theory is about. Well, the, an important thing is to realize that when we are talking about many models, especially when we are talking about an infinitely, uh, an infinite number of models, this is not compression at all. Because when we are using many, many models, we are not compressing the evidence. In fact, the, the theory is much larger than the evidence we try to analyze or we try to compress. So when we're talking about this theory, well, they are related ideas about compression, but this is not compression, OK? Well, and of course, we have problems about using many models and that, well, this is not practical. And, and when we are talking about resource bonding, bonded agents, and of course, there's something in the, in the middle, just using a small number of models, and we can use uh, a posterior weighted uh, uh, mixture of, let's say, half a dozen models or something, the, the most important models. Okay? Well, another issue is when we talk about one part compression versus two part compression. And this is not mainstream in, in, in general when we talk about compression, uh, but in one part compression, we only just look for a code, and this code has to, if we execute this code, it has to give the data. And we don't have any other constraint about the way or the shape or how this uh, code is arranged. In fact, we don't even talk about the model, because this doesn't have to be a model. It's just some data where we execute, it gives the data that we have at hand. Okay? Well, the problem about this approach is that we can compress something uh, in a high degree, but well, then the, the data or the program that compresses the evidence is completely, uh, uh, it's very difficult to reuse, to understand, and to share with the models of other parts of the evidence. So there's a, an alternative approach, uh, which is called two-part compression, where we try to separate, and I emphasize the word try, we try to emphasize a model from the data covered by the model. So we try to put all the exceptions, and all the data, and all the evidence covered by the model, but try to separate the general theory from what we uh, express with that theory. There's not a clear cut in general between the theory and the data covered by the theory, but at least there are some approaches we try to separate these two things. And probably you are, you are more familiar with the MDL principle than with the MML principle. Well, 
they are similar but not equal in MML precedes MDL by about a decade. And the last issue is about lossless and lossy compressions and compression and in computer science this is much more familiar. And lossy compression is much more frequent in the real world and in cognition. Uh, but the problem is that in computer science when we do lossy compression we have something that is called in, in this area, in the, it's called the distortion criterion, which says what information is irrelevant and can be lost in the compression. But this is very difficult to uh, define and analyze and precisely uh, clarify or to, to have the concept of what's relevant or not in cognition. Well, this is one of the issues, this is one of the problems. So, well, talking about lossless compression, is it, well, this is the right way to, to go, but, well, we don't have a clear distortion criteria, so we can have an image compression, compression or audio compression. Okay, we, we have some experimental or some um, uh, clear distortion criteria. Well, um, lossless compression is much less frequent in cognition, I would say. Okay, we are not used to do that. We always uh, remove details when we are just perceiving and acting and, and just uh, understanding the world. We try to, to eliminate all that is irrelevant. This is a key issue about condition. So, well, these ideas when we are talking about compression, well, we have to say, okay, it is more about lossless uh, compression that, sorry, more, more about lossless compression than lossless compression. And, well, this is, of course, related to the previous two issues, because when we are talking about a two-part code, we can see the first part of the code as a theory as the lossy part, and then the second part of the code, it is the part that gives the detail. But we want to analyze the theory, which is the general theory, and then all the details that code the evidence, that in case we can use to code that evidence, and including the exceptions, if any, to the, to the theory, to the model, or to the hypothesis, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, so these three issues are important when we talk about um, compression and intelligence, when we move to the realm of social environments, communication, and all of this, and we try to analyze the role of compression when we have competition between several, among several agents, or we have collaboration, cooperation among agents, then we see that some of these features uh, are even more important. For instance, when we talk about competition, we can say, okay, we can use a large mixture of metals, or models to explain or to predict what another agent is going to do. Of course, we can do that. But most probably, the other agent is not having a, a, a hundred hypo hypotheses on its mind. Probably, it's going to be a reduced number of hypotheses. So, well, here we are not saying that we only have to consider one hypothesis, but typically we work with a reduced number of hypotheses. So while well, perhaps it's not a one uh, model, but it's, uh, my reading is about trying to think of what's in the other agent's mind. And there's probably there are a few guesses there, not an infinite number of them. But well, this is even more important in cooperation. And I think cooperation is especially for human cognition or human level intelligence is much important than competition. And in cooperation, which is of course related to language, if we want to share models of reality, we need to work with one model and not with many models. We have to share an ontology and we have to share a language. This language is about one concept and the same concept for all. And the concept is agreed in some way. So we cannot work with an ensemble of models to explain reality. So we have to agree on many things. Otherwise, communication is impossible. So the idea of one model, many model, and compression is even more uh, uh, relevant here than in other, in other areas. Well, and in fact, language is, when we talk about lossy and lossless compression, language can be seen as a kind of lossily compressing the world. Well, and when we move about these ideas and can, how can we, or how uh, these ideas can be used for detecting, 
defining, especially assessing or evaluating intelligence, that it is uh, something that we are working this, and, and especially in the last years I'm working on, on the evaluation of intelligence. Well, we have two approaches. One approach is introspection, and the other approach is uh, a behavioral approach. Probably in the introspection approach, which is much more difficult, you can say, okay, if I can see your code, and your code compresses the data, I can say that you are intelligent. So this is, this is an interesting approach, but it is very difficult to, to apply in practice. First, because we can only, or it is much more difficult to apply that with lossy compression, because you have to analyze what have you lost and what have, what's, what's the other uh, model uh, has lost from the evidence. So this is not comparable. So this has been applied for loss, less compression. And loss-less compression, we have, in, we have argued that, well, perhaps this is not so closely related to condition. So, well, there's a problem about this. And of course, it, there's a problem in general about introspecting the mind. So the typical approach is the behavioral approach. One typical case is the Turing test, which is a behavioral test, where we try to, to analyze the behavior of an agent without going into uh, its mind or their mind. There's, there have been some approaches using common complexity or related ideas um, about this. And even in this case, we see that compression appears here again. So that doesn't mean that the behavioral approach just dismisses compression at all. Here, the notion of compression appears again because well, we need to evaluate the complexity of tasks that we use to evaluate intelligence, and we can use these ideas for that. Mm -hmm. And second, we need to define a distribution for these tasks. And the idea of a universal distribution appears again. And of course, you know that a universal distribution is related to the notion of compression. So while behavioral evaluation is not directly related to compression, but in the end, the notion of, of compression appears again. So, so just as I wrap up, and, and as I, I've mentioned before, this is kind of a messy compression of the paper, so you can extend some of these ideas in, in the paper. I think that compression is fundamental in intelligence or, or is a, a key idea in, in intelligence. But the simple idea of intelligence as compression, there was a hot topic in the late 90s, I would say. Well, this has to be uh, taken, or this has to be very uh, precisely defined what compression we are talking about and, and all of that. And the issue is about one part versus two parts, one model versus many models, and lossless versus lossless, lossy compression have to be taken into account when we are talking about compression. And I would say that this is even more important when we are talking about social environments, especially when we are talking about cooperation, language, and all of that. Well, this is just uh, an analysis that further things should be investigated, and especially we have to be very careful when we say that compression and intelligence are related, because it is uh, it is very uh, it will be very um, um, I would say it would be uh, counter uh, intuitive to say that in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a direct way and people could be misled by, by this if we are not precise about what we are talking about. So I, I agree or I would say that I think that these are related but we have to be very careful. And this paper is just raising some of the issues that should be considered in, we don't have the answers. Okay, so it's just that these issues should be uh, taken into account. Okay, so this is my uh, first presentation. Okay, and my, my second presentation is what I call suicidal research. And suicidal research is, try to, is to try to do your best to refute your own theories. So in this case, we, we have a theory. And this theory is, and it's not our own theory, this theory has been emerging in the last, I would say, 15 years, that there's a way to define intelligence. We can extract uh, intelligence tests from these definitions and use these tests to evaluate 
not only machines, but also humans, humans and even animals. This is a theory. So let's try to refute the theory. Okay, this is our theory and let's try to refute it. So this is inside the project. And in fact, we are trying to refute the project. And this project is called uh, AnyInt, Anytime Universal Intelligence. And the goal was uh, to analyze whether it is possible to define an intelligence test for any kind of system now or in the future, any moment in its development, any degree of intelligence, any speed, and that the evaluation could be stopped at any time. We started with this project three or four years ago. And well, in fact, uh, last year in, in AGI last year, I, uh, I, we also had some presentations inside this project as well. And we are almost having some kind of conclusions about this project. The conclusions are that, well, this is promising, but well, there are many things to be done. OK, some precedents you probably uh, know better than me, the Turing test about testing intelligence and also the catchers, captures that you are uh, using them every day. So, well, they are not universal. That's something I have, haven't mentioned properly. When we use the word universal, it's in the same way that you can use the word universal in USB. So it has to be useful or applicable to everything. That's the, the meaning of the word universal. Well, this is a little bit a pun because this is also related to the idea of a universal distribution, but we are going to get into details uh, after this. But the, the word universal here is because we want to apply this to all the figures you have on the left, okay? Well, so uh, apart from these two precedents, or not exactly precedents in, in, in the case of captures, uh, deriving tests based on column of complexity started in the late 90s, and some of the ideas introduced compression extended Turing tests, where Turing tests were extended with compression task. This was introduced in the late 90s, and I introduced a C test that was derived as a formal definition of intelligence, and we derived a set of tasks derived from a distribution, and we use this distribution to create examples such as this or tasks such as this, and with this test we evaluated humans, and the test is quite similar to uh, an IQ test, and we got the result that the results correlated with IQ test because we also used an IQ test uh, for humans apart from this test. This, has, this doesn't say anything because any complex test correlates with IQ test, as you probably know, even tests play in correlates with, uh, with IQ uh, in, in, in general. But the interesting thing was to uh, relate the complexity of the problem, which was derived by variant of common complexity, with the result that humans uh, uh, showed on these problems. And there was a high correlation. And that was inter interesting as a proof of concept, I would say. Well, the problem is that uh, some people like to refute theories. Uh, this, this people are always there, especially scientists. Uh, and David, which is one of the co who is one of the co-authors here, they just wrote um, a program, just 1,000 lines of code. And with this program, they were able to pass IQ tests. So clearly, IQ tests are not universal tests. They are useful to evaluate humans, but only humans. Okay. So, well, if we, with this theory, we get something very similar to IQ tests, and IQ tests are not universal. These tests are not universal. So, okay, project cancelled. We just forgot about this, and time passed. And, well, there was something new in the arena, which it was called universal intelligence, and probably you know about this. And the interesting thing about this, or, or the most interesting, because there are many good things about uh, this idea is that, well, intelligence is not only about inference, inductive inference, it's also about planning. So you can model the world, but if you, you are not able to use this modeling in the right way, you're not used to use your theories in the right way, 
well, you're not intelligent. You model the way, but you, you're not able to use these models in the proper way. So with these ideas, we have intelligence as learning plus planning. So uh, yeah, interactivity is important. Planning is important. So this should be in the formula somehow. Well, so this makes this apparently different from an IQ test. So let's try to analyze this. So when we analyze this, about two years ago, we or well, three years ago, we started, well, oh, but, well, this definition has some problems in practice. Theoretically, it's a, it's a reference. It's a nice reference. It, uh, it gives many ideas. It clarifies things. But it has some problems. It says, if we want to create a test, because a definition of intelligence is not an, a, an intelligence test. So we try to modify or try to address some issues that could convert this into, and the previous theories related to uh, universal intelligence into a test. And we did this, or we tried to do this in a paper we published last year in the Artificial Intelligence Journal. And well, we, we uh, addressed some, some of these issues about how we could implement a test. In fact, last year in AGI, we presented a, a, an environment class that could be used as a base uh, for defining the distribution of environments and from here to create uh, a test. So in this paper, and after all of this uh, story, in this paper, what we are doing is just to construct an implementation of the test, which of course has a lot of simplifications, I must say that and try to use that test to evaluate humans and machines. And when I say machines, it's just a particular uh, algorithm. Well, we just used uh, spaces, a very simple approach with the spaces, cells, with action, observations, a quite typical uh, kind of uh, environment class that you can see in, especially in reinforcement learning or some other areas. One particular thing we use is that we define two special agents, uh, good and evil. They, they are symmetric, and they are responsible for the rewards. So this gives us a nice property that says that a random agent scores zero in this test. It has an expected result of, or expected uh, reward of zero. And this is interesting to calibrate the result. You know, OK, above zero, this is something better than random. Below zero, this is worse than random, which is a little bit meaningless. But, well, this was just a, a tricky thing. This can be done in many other ways, but we did in, in this way. And then we moved to the test, and we only generated seven environments. You go to a reinform, reinforcement learning conference or machine learning conference, and you say, okay, we've been working with seven environments. And I say, okay, this is directly rejected. It is too few. But we can't do much more with humans. Only seven environments took about 20 minutes, a 20 minutes test. And well, you can extend that to, you can double that, but you cannot increase that. You cannot make a test for a human in about 10 hours. You cannot do that. And uh, well, so since we wanted to administer that for humans, uh, we only derive seven environments and randomly, well, the details about how this is precisely uh, derived when I, when, I mean, when I say randomly is in the paper. And we apply that to Q-learning and to humans. Q-learning is just an off-the-shelf algorithm. It wasn't our intention to analyze the, the state of the art of reinforcement learning. And why did you try or why don't you try with this new uh, algorithm? No, 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 no. This is not our goal. Our goal is just to compare an off-the-shelf algorithm from reinforcement learning with humans in, in this uh, environment. And for the humans, we derive a, an interface. And the interface, we tried to do that. And we had some psychologists in the group. We tried to be as uh, less um, anthropomorphic as possible. But this is not always possible. But in the end, we try to not to favor one or the other. And of course, you can argue about this. but. And the experiments, well, the experiments were paired, which I mean that the same environments were used for both types of agents. And if you look at the results, they are fully similar, okay, in mean and variance. 
and almost everything was quite the same. And just Q-learning is not the best algorithm nowadays. It has had a lot of improvements in the last uh, years, and there are also other uh, algorithms in reinforcement learning that are more powerful, especially with uh, general uh, environment classes, this one. So, well, okay, so we have that uh, simple Q-learning is almost as good as humans. We also saw that uh, the complexity of the environments is related to the results. I could say that well, performance and machine performance are not specific tasks. Well, we, we can do a test playing game or test playing algorithm and we can compare humans with our algorithm or a vision thing or in many areas we have compared humans with machines. But not something that is, well, let's try a general task or general task uh, uh, class and try to compare them without any special, spe specialization, neither from the humans nor the machines. But the main conclusion of the paper is that while the results show in a very clear way that this is not a universal intelligence test, because we should see the differences, the differences between Q-learning and humans, clearly, and we don't see that those differences. In fact, of course, we can find better algorithms and to get better results for, Q for, for the machines, I would say. So what may be wrong? Well, there are many things that might be wrong. And I don't know the answer. Okay, some, uh, there might be problems with the current implementation. We did a lot of simplifications. Uh, the environment class might be wrong. Uh, the distribution might be wrong, the distribution that we use. The interfaces maybe were too difficult for humans. I don't know, I don't think so, but well, this can be argued as well. And a problem of the theory. Uh, the, the theory might be wrong in many ways. First. Perhaps this is completely nonsense. We can say, okay, intelligence cannot be measured universally. But if this is the case, this is going to be a problem in the future. Okay, a very big problem. So, well, we take this as, as a hypothesis, but perhaps this hypothesis is wrong. And, of course, we know the intelligence is factorial. So, why are you measuring intelligence? Why don't you measure different abilities and then try to devise some kind of compound measure from, from those? Perhaps you're trying to be too simplistic with just... I mean, in this, intelligence is just one thing. And, of course, we can say that algorithmic information theory, it, perhaps it is necessary, but it, perhaps it's not sufficient. Okay? I don't know. These are just possible questions. Something doesn't work, and we want to know the answers about why this doesn't work. So the third paper, and I, have, I think I have to be very quick. Uh, I, I'm not going to because I had only 11 minutes for each talk. Um, we're going to try to address these two issues. Just assuming that the problem is this, that the distribution is wrong, the class is wrong, let's try to find a better uh, problem or task or environment class and a better distribution. That's what we address in our third paper. Uh, well, it has a very long title, but I will say, okay, when you talk about intelligence and you see a lot of definitions, in many occasions, you don't see evolution in the definition. You don't see Darwin or Darwin and Wallace, if we want to include uh, Alfred Russell Wallace in, in the definition, which is also uh, had, had to have some credit about uh, evolution as well. We don't see evolution in the definition. We're okay, the, the adaptability, well, adaptability in, in a range of environments, environments, adaptability, they have. These terms are also used in biology. So, well, we can see the, that there's a relation. But, or not, but I say, okay, intelligence is here because it's the, the outcome or one of the results of a process of evolution. So how can we have a, a, a definition of intelligence with, without evolution, in the, not only in the formulas, but only in the words? We, we don't see that, generally. Okay, so... But... The use of a universal distribution, a formalization of the set of, of tasks or environments that we want to use to define and to evaluate intelligence are very appealing. So we wouldn't uh, like to take one thing and to remove the other. So how can we combine both things? Well, I'm going to be very quick on this. So I'm going to skip this. I'm going to compress this. Um, 
so you know we are we are in favor about artificial general intelligence so there's no need to criticize uh, artificial specific intelligence so probably you're familiar about uh, a universal distribution or the family of universal distributions we can use that to generate tasks or environments and these have been used uh, in the last 15 years uh, in well, here you can find the references. Well, the good thing about a universal distribution, I have been mentioning this uh, a couple of times in the other uh, presentation as well, it has some advantages, but it has also some disadvantages. Let's focus on the disadvantages, okay? But because it, the advantages are not important, but let's focus on the problem. The problem is that we have an arbitrary choice of the reference machine. This is, well, we there's a constant there that we can just ignore. Well. I'm not sure we can ignore that constant. And, but the, the, the problem I'm interested in here is that an environment of real interest, interest is, has a, a probability almost zero. And I think Bill uh, has raised these issues in, in, in previous editions of AGI. And I realized that last year. And so I, I, I hope that we can just discuss on these issues because we are doing quite similar or related work, I would say. And well, so well, the probability of an in, any interesting environment to appear in this distribution is almost zero. Of course, you can fix, you can change the reference machine, but even just surely choosing this uh, reference machine, uh, well, the probability of environments with some other agents over there, some other intelligent agents over there, that's where intelligent has to prove that it, it, it is useful with other agents, with other intelligent agents, this is not there in the distribution. This probability is almost zero. And when we talk about that intelligence, about social cognition, the cultural intelligence hypothesis, I'm taking this from um, evolutionary psychology and, and, and comparative psychology. Of course, in artificial intelligence, we have seen this drift in the last 20 years about multi-agent agent, multi -agent uh, um, uh, uh, things and all this approach, okay? Well, there are some alternative proposal, okay? This a universal distribution is perhaps much too general. So let's try to modify this or to find some alternatives. And well, we can use more realistic, simplify worlds, not using a universal distribution. For example, you have an example as the AGI preschool. Well, this could be a, a set of, of environments or environment where we could just use as a test bed for AGI systems. Or we could you just use a very particular reference machine. For instance, we could use a distribution on games in order to evaluate intelligence because games are always there, typically some other agents around. And our approach is to alter a universal distribution and to say, okay, let's include other agents in the distribution <laughs> and let's try to evolve the, the distribution. So, well, I'm going to be very quick on the formulas, uh, but the idea is just to define a distribution of agents using a universal distribution and let it evolve in some way according to their performance in or their rewards. So this is quite similar to an evolutionary system when we don't have, the environment can be replaced at any time, so there's no specialization to any specific environment. So environments change from time to time, so this makes that agents get more adaptive to general environments or to changing environments, not to a very specialized environment. And we don't have uh, uh, things that you, find, you, you might find in other evolutionary approaches, well, this is just a proposal. This hasn't to be like that. But the idea is that we include in the definitions that we have, we have many other agents, and these agents, depending on there's, um, there's um, an, an, an iteration I there that says that depending on the moment that you take the, the distribution, you can have higher or lower intelligence for the other agents. And it's in this context that we, you, you need to evaluate your agent. So, well, this is, uh, what does this family of distribution mean? Well, it just assigns probabilities to multi-agent environments 
give you more uh, distribution, more probability, higher probability for uh, complex adaptive agents for large values of i. Okay, so we can start with i equals zero, which is just a universal distribution, and we can just try to evolve that. Okay, so this is this is this. For me, it is appealing. I don't know if it is for you, but it has a lot of problems in practice. Well, this is a product of distribution. They are not independent, so I don't know if this is a well-constructed idea in the end. The distribution is not computable. Well, we can use approximations. And we are not using some evolution accelerators such as mutations, crossover, genotype. We are not using anything of this. So you go, oh, this is even worse than natural evolution. Yes, it is. But this is not our goal to derive agents from these distributions, just to define the distribution. So is there any way where we can uh, approximate this distribution? Well, so since we are working on testing, let's say that we can do that through testing. So, so the idea is that we can use research to even evolution instead of natural evolution. So we can introduce agents. So you claim you have an agent, let's say, put it into the system, and let's try to work with other systems other people are doing, and let's just to construct some kind of generations. You are good at this low generation, but that doesn't mean that you are good at high generation, and try to evolve that. Okay, this cannot be that in, done in a week, okay? But, well, this is an idea, but for that we need to use intelligence tests. Otherwise, there's no way to say where to put and, okay, okay. And um, well, so just because I have to finish, um, it's important to say that this is not a distribution of life forms. This is a distribution of mind forms, okay? Because the body is not important. We are not interested about bacteria or cockroaches. They are very adaptive to a kind of environments. We are not interested in that. So that's some of the modifications, some of the definitions were just thought because we didn't want a distribution of life forms. And here you have the trace and make this distribution, this, this distinction. Well, so I would say that this raises more questions than it answers, but probably it helps understand why a universal distribution may be too general to address intelligence. And I think that putting Darwin, Darwin Wallace in the formula, I think is a must. So we have to do somewhere. Probably this is not the right way, but I'm sure that we have to find a way to put evolution in our formal definitions of intelligence. Okay, I think, I think that's it. We're going to invite uh, the authors up to do a quick uh, Q&A now in the panel discussion format. Yes. Hi, I would like to ask you about kind of <laughs> almost looking simple problem. Do you think the spider is intelligent? How would you measure the intelligence of the spider or bacteria or a worm? Secondly, do you think that you would measure the intelligence, for example, of the system in terms of the complexity? For example, sand in the beach, it's a complex system, many elements. Is it intelligent or not? How would you approach it? Could you answer those, those questions? Is a spider intelligent? Or Yes or no, please? Well, these, these are good questions, but um, when we say universal, uh, <laughs> you have to put the limit somewhere. Uh, well, probably this is uh, similar to the problem that uh, comparative psychology is facing. When, we, well, there are some uh, tests uh, that are taking on swarms or spiders, but Typically, we are talking about uh, systems that can be rewarded in some way that so we can just uh, condition the actions in some way to get some of our goals so we can use some kind of testing. So perhaps we can do that with a spider. I don't know, but perhaps we can do that. Uh, but, well, this is, this is relevant. This is relevant because we are, I think we are starting the house okay. from the, from the roof. About, and how, that, how about a bacteria? Uh, well, for, or, or for, for example, a thermostat, the system that is just reactive, memoryless system. Can you say it is intelligent? Do you need well, the well, memory it, for the intelligence? It's not, not, not a question of saying if some, something is intelligent or not. It's just to say whether we can just scale that in some way. Okay. So, so that's not a limit. Okay, this is intelligent, this is not intelligent. It's just to put some, something in, in a scale. So probably, 
I'm not saying that because we, we are having a lot of problems with, let's say, yes. humans, chimpanzees, and cue learning. So even for spiders, this is going to be, so, or for sand, this is so going to be more So there is no, no de definite answer if the spider is intelligent or not. Well, the idea is to put a degree. degree. I'm not sure if this is going to be a linear scale. Probably it is not a linear scale, but to assess this. You cannot in, in say same, yes or no? No, no, no. The idea okay. is not to say yes or no. Okay. The idea is to, to grade And thermostat, let, let's say, when you are turning on off the light, is it intelligent or not? Well, oh, uh, sorry, when light it, it, it con yeah, controls not, the not temperature. Probably, even with this, if you are able to give some rewards to the system, the system can react to these rewards, and you can evaluate that. If you can do that, probably this is going to put the system somewhere in the scale. Okay. And this is good for me. Okay. Um, I'm afraid mine's also mainly directed to you, but uh, I think it is more general. It seems to me there's a kind of compression or compressibility that has, hasn't been mentioned explicitly, and I was talking about it yesterday when I talked about what happened to young children when they develop competences and then reorganize it. And the sort of reorganization that goes on, of which an example is going from pattern-based language use to using a syntax, which enables you to go way beyond the examples you've encountered, but has one feature. It doesn't compress the data because the data are totally ignored. You do not have to remember anything you heard before in order to use the syntax that you've now learned. So, and that seems to me something that we can call abstraction as opposed to compression because you're not compressing something and retaining it, not even in a lossy way. You're throwing it away and coming up with something else which is more powerful and can be applied to new instances. And it seems to me that that's what human uh, and a lot of animal intelligence is about, and I don't know whether it's a special case of what you were talking about and I've just not understood, or whether it's going out in a totally different direction. But that's what goes on when we have children discovering toddler theorems, I think. I don't know if I have understood you properly, because when I would think about an, an abstraction and this is able to uh, describe future data in a proper way, I see compression. Uh, and you say, well, this is not compression, so... Uh, I'm, I'm very precise you. about the sense in, which it's, sense in which it's not compression. It's a result of interacting with lots of examples, but all those examples are thrown away, and there may not be any record of any one of them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, I don't think that uh, that fits some of the things that you seem to be saying about compression, which would enable you to go back to the kinds of things you met before. Uh, this just enables you to deal with a whole class of things which may be very much more general than what you've got before and may not always do work very well on what you've got before. But maybe I've misunderstood uh, the sort of compressibility uh, you're talking about. Yeah. Certainly the algorithmic compressibility that I know about keeps everything. Yeah, not necessarily. Uh, but, but, well, there's a point, well, you can compress something and they say, okay, but I'm not interested about what I compress. And I'm interested, in, let's say, in the theory and how can I use that, but not in the data you compress. Yeah. The data is just a tool that I use just to, to, create, to model the world. So, but, well, in the end, this is compression, but it's not the, the observation what we want to compress, but probably that uh, we want to model the world. And we are thinking about, probably because we are pre-designed about thinking, well, if this data is given here, this is going to be the same distribution or probably the same distribution because we are in the same world. So we, I can drop the data and I can keep the models that they are going to be useful in the future because the data is not relevant. And the test should be capable of being much more complex than any of the data. That's one of the requirements for the comp abstraction that I'm talking about. Like the child who learns how to build something he's never seen before because he's got a syntax for it and he can use the syntax to generate new instances which have deeply nested structures which is never encountered in real yeah, life. Yeah, that's a good point because children probably they are not perfect uh, compressing machines. And I think that they are a relation, but we have to be very careful because humans are not perfect compression machines. They, they overfit sometimes. They, they do things that are wrong in, the, in terms of inductive inference. But because our environment is not it's so general environment, so this, and we are pre-designed to do some wrong things in general, but they work very well for our social environment and for language especially. And our physical environment. Sorry? And our physical environment. Yeah, 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 as well. Yeah. Euclidean geometry is an example. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I have a question mostly to the other ones. Um, I found it really counterintuitive that uh, a goal-driven agent would choose this uh, delusional thing, because I thought the point of a goal-driven one was that it only cared about the state of the environment, right? 
Um, <clears throat> that's right. But uh, it's easy for a, uh, if you define the goal seeking agent as something that wants to make a certain observation, right? or some series of observations. So the goal-seeking agent is trying to observe something, and that's what it's trying to achieve. It can use the delusion box then to um, be able to, let's see, um, to be able to uh, trick itself and observe those things that are part of its utility function. But just one precision. Um, well, the, the agents are behavioral. They only receive observation and do actions. You can say anything about a particular state, real state of the world. You can't know the real world. You only have observations. So you can put a variable there and there and say you want to do something about that variable. But won't the agent sort of know that it's deceived? Is, that's not a problem. Sorry? The agent won't know that it's deceived then. Well, if you... Yeah, it yeah, doesn't okay, care. Yeah, sure. It it's, it's, uh, only yeah. searches for the best way to maximize its And utility. it's not possible to define it so that it's, it does care whether it's deceived or not, and it does make, I don't know. It's just well, for example, you can say, hmm, this is strange. I, I seem to be able to uh, get 